Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us as we release our inaugural Cook County Equity Fund Report. I'm excited for you to hear directly from the people who put it together in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the other elected officials and Equity Fund Task Force members who've joined us today. Commissioner Brandon Johnson, my Chief of Staff, Lynetta Haynes-Turner, Dr. Kieran Joshi, co-lead of the Cook County Department of Public Health, Horatio Mendez, Woodstock Institute, accompanied by Brett Adams, Lisa Bly Jones of the Chicago Jobs Council, where I was formerly executive director long ago and far away, <laughs> Kate Redling, Coalition for Black Lives, accompanied by two additional members of the coalition, and Anna Lee of the Chicago Community Trust. Again, thank you all for being here. And I want to thank all 89, 89 members of our Equity Fund Task Force. 89 people from across 35 partner organizations, plus staff from Cook County, have been hard at work for the last 10 months, almost a year. We've come together to bring ideas and solutions on how to structurally change outcomes across our county for our most, our most vulnerable residents. Needless to say, this is not an easy task. And I want to publicly commend every person who contributed their time and talents to this endeavor since last May. Thank you all. Now, let me take a minute to remind us of how we got here. In the summer of 2020, when the pandemic made it crystal clear that our priorities throughout the past nine years of making tough fiscal decisions and strategic management were right on target, we still found that many of our friends and neighbors were vulnerable to economic and health-related hardship. At the time when we faced a significant drop in revenue caused by the pandemic, increased unemployment, stay-at-home orders, and calls for racial justice not seen in a generation, I can stand here today and say that we responded with our values at the forefront. That's excellence, engagement, and equity. With only the CARES Act's federal assistant, assistance known at that time, and with the leadership from my colleague on the Board of Commissioners, who you'll hear from in a minute, that's Brandon Johnson, we made it a priority to meet this moment. We didn't just create another resolution about racism or the causes of the pain so many were experiencing disproportionately then. We made a plan. We made a commitment in our budget to the people who needed us most. We did not equivocate, and the result was the creation of the Cook County Equity Fund and Task Force. The formation of the fund and task force demonstrate that equity is not just an aspirational goal. We're funding it. We're putting into action our values, and we are committed to working with our community partners to make these efforts inclusive, sustainable, responsive, and impactful. Our vision for the equity fund is very simple. We want safe, healthy and thriving communities in all areas of Cook County, not just the ones with the most resources. We challenged ourselves to reimagine and transform systems around justice, public health, safety, housing, economic opportunity, community development and social services, all of them to benefit black and brown communities. We did this by proactively investing in resources and solutions and supports to achieve equitable outcomes for folks who have not been at the center historically of government action. To start, Cook County allocated $40 million in our equity fund budget in 2021. And in fiscal year 2022, we added an additional 10 million. This 50 million total is part of over 100 million in equity aligned investments that have and will bring more equitable outcomes for our county's most vulnerable residents. The report releasing today will detail the work of the task force and lay out the equity-centered policy and investment recommendations that we will work on over the coming years to achieve these safe, healthy, and thriving communities. These investments, over time, will positively impact our residents, their communities, and our collective future. Just as we've done providing relief to folks at the height of the pandemic, we'll do the same and more as we look toward creating structural change with these equity fund investments. I've said it before and I'll say it again. 
The good work we've done will inform the good work we intend to do. And believe me, we have lots more work to do. And we look forward to partnering with many of you in this room today to ensure that outcomes for our most vulnerable residents improve, that people's lives improve. I want to especially thank my Chief of Staff, Lynetta Haynes-Turner, who you'll hear from just a minute, and her team leading the charge on the equity fund. Commissioner Brandon Johnson has also been a fierce advocate for the structural and systemic change that we need moving forward. And now I'll turn it over to him to tell you a little bit more about how we're budgeting for equity. Commissioner. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. You know, it's, it's, I, you know, I say this a lot, and I'll just reiterate it one more time. you got to put social studies teachers in charge of government. Uh, when, you, when you do that, things are a little bit better. Uh, and so I'll be remiss if I didn't say, in, in all seriousness, um, the level of anxiety um, and the stress and the duress that our communities have endured for generations um, has been something that government has struggled um, to figure out how to alleviate and provide real relief. And of course, before the murder of George Floyd and before this pandemic, we've all been very clear about the systemic racism and inequality, inequality that exists within our communities. And in times of crisis, it's important that we have powerful, bold, tenacious leaders that are not only prepared, but willing to do what is right. And that's who we have in our president, President Parkwinkle. So thank you. That's the part where you all clap there. Thank you. That's how I envision it. Thank you. So now that I only have 90 seconds left because of your long applause, um, you know, organizing government is difficult, you know, and, and getting government to move at a pace that's required in order to address uh, the systemic challenges that we have is it's very difficult. And so I'm very proud that I've had the opportunity to work um, in this capacity with uh, a number of commissioners um, who were committed to expediting and speeding up the process to bring real healing and transformation into our communities. You know, the truth of the matter is, when you think about um, the economic challenges that we have, especially in, in Cook County, where women in particular um, are struggling to make ends meet, uh, young people are looking for a little bit of hope, the stress that we experience because of homelessness, uh, these things have been exacerbated, quite frankly, because of the failures of others who just refuse to, to, to act. And so when I think about the broad-based coalition that brought us this moment, looking for something to do and do it in a meaningful way, it was the faith community, labor community, community-based organizations that said we have to put money and investments into our communities. Dr. King made it very clear that the evils that this country face, one of which is militarism, the addiction that our society has on jailing and incarcerating folks is a whack, tired system, and it's about time that we have people in position that are willing to transform that wicked system. Yes. And so finally, you know, you know, as we move forward, there are those that have already become exacerbated by our level of advocacy and justice. Whether it's storming the Capitol, attacking black women who are in a position to actually lead our judicial system, or any other whack person um, that, that seems to find its space in attacking those who are fighting for justice. I'm reminded, I'm not going to preach, but I will close with this. We cannot get weary in our well-doing. And those that wish to turn us around, we're going to look them in the face and we're going to power forward. And so as we invest hundreds of millions of dollars into our community, I am relieved and grateful that the shoulders in which we stand on today can now begin to re recognize that what they could only dream of, we are realizing that, and Cook County government is leading the way. Thank you very much. Okay, and without further ado, uh, one of the most brilliant minds uh, in, in government is the Chief of Staff. Y'all make her feel really good, Lynetta Haynes Turner. All right, so that was probably the wrong person to go after, so thank you. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone, good morning. and thank you to both the President and Commissioner Johnson. My name is Lynetta Haynes-Turner, Chief of Staff to the President. I'm especially honored to stand before you today as the primary lead of the Equity Fund and its task force. The work of the task force could not have happened without the thought partnership, facilitation, and leadership of Mara Hennigan, 
who was the lead author of the Equity Fund Report and is now our former Director of Policy, a bittersweet recent development. Unfortunately, Mara couldn't join us today, but I thank her for all of her hard work in getting us to this announcement, and she will be with us in May. Special thanks to the task force members who met regularly over the last 10 months, all on Zoom amid the pandemic and a shift to remote work. Imagine facilitating an 89-member Zoom meeting twice a month of actively engaged and committed leaders. It was certainly a pleasure, and they kept us on our toes. The work of government from an equity lens and the reasons why racial equity matters, for me, has never been clearer than it has been over the last few years, even before the pandemic occurred. From our work in crafting the policy roadmap to strengthening our commitment to operationalize racial equity in government, the establishment of the Equity Fund and its task force serves to deepen that work that we must do with our partners to truly reimagine and transform the very systems, policies, and practices that have harmed too many of our residents. Since its establishment in May of 2021, the task force has consistently met twice a month. We learned about Cook County government and how we do our work. We explored the myriad of systems that have negatively impacted our residents for decades and engaged in thought-provoking discussions on how Cook County could start to address these structural and systemic barriers that prevent the meaningful advancement of equity across Cook County. It should be no surprise that those very systems negatively impact the very same communities that have the worst social and economic outcomes, whether you look at health indicators, community safety, housing, or economic opportunity. Let me lift up some sobering statistics that the task force grappled with during its work. These statistics clearly demonstrate the need for government and its partners to do more now in order to create a more equitable future and more equitable outcomes for everyone who lives in Cook County. Nationally, more than 50% of black and Latine renters across the U.S are cost burden, which means they spend more than 50% of their monthly income on rent, spend 37% less per month on food, and 77% less on health care than other households. Black Americans are five times more likely to be stopped by the police and five times more likely to be incarcerated than white Americans. And 70% of the children living in poverty are children of color doesn't get any better in Chicago and Cook County. The black unemployment in Chicago is three times higher than the national average. Our 30-year life expectancy gap is the largest in the nation. And despite record long economic growth pre-pandemic, white households have an average of 10 times more wealth than black households and eight times more than Latine households nationally. Armed with these statistics, the task force worked to develop the 25 policy recommendations outlined in our report. These policy recommendations collectively, once implemented, will help create more equitable outcomes and an equitable future for our residents and the communities in which they live. As a starting point, equity means that every resident will have access to enough quality food to live an active, healthy life, that every resident will feel safe in their homes, in their communities, and in their workplaces, that every resident will have access to an affordable, stable, safe, and quality home, and access to effective services and benefits that enables them to meet their basic needs. And last but not least, that every resident will have access to quality job opportunities, equal pay for equal work, and access to affordable financial services that promote economic participation and stability. In ending, I am proud of the work we've all done collectively thus far, but as the President said, there is much more work to do. We will do that work through the lens of transparency and accountability as our track record demonstrates. The task force will continue to meet over the course of this year to further develop the necessary implementation plans for the policy recommendations, and to continue advising as the equity fund initiatives evolves. The sky is the limit. 
We will hold a special hearing in May to further examine the report and we'll have many more of our task force members join at that time. And it's our hope for a vote by the Board of Commissioners at the May 12th board meeting so that we can advance the work to create a better, more equitable Cook County. Thank you. Thank you, Lynetta, and thank you for your good work and, and uh, Mara Hennigan's good work on putting together the report, not to mention managing the process. All right, Dr. Kieran Josie, who's co-lead of our Cook County Department of Public Health. And then I would ask um, Horatio Mendez of Woodstock Institute to follow. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioner Johnson, colleagues, um, I'm so happy to be here this morning to talk about equity. At the Cook County Department of Public Health, advancing health equity is in our mission and it is in our very DNA. Our work is grounded in the understanding, backed by public health science, that the differences we see in health outcomes, which are health inequities in Cook County, are the result of injustice. Injustice stemming from structural racism, sexism, all the isms, and not just individual behaviors. This injustice is historic, but it's also contemporary. The report released today highlights this and states that in order to advance racial equity, government must reckon with how public policies and practices not only created inequities, but can currently sometimes sustain them. So I am thrilled that our health department with this amazing team working with us is charged with advancing a health equity in all policies approach. Through this, we'll work with partners and sister agencies to ensure that Cook County government factors health considerations into its implementation of policies and programs and identifies gaps to improve health outcomes for all our residents and communities. We know that racial justice and equity are societal issues that will take time and will take all of us working together to address. I'm confident that the work stemming from this report will help us get there and dismantle racism. Thank you. Thank you and good morning everybody. Good morning. I hope you're all enjoying this beautiful spring day. All the while the weather may suck, where is a beautiful day? We have a lot to celebrate. There's been a bit of a change since that August day in 1986 when Ronald Reagan introduced us to the nine most terrifying words in the English language. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Locally, I've been impressed with what's been accomplished by government. Uh, just in the last 12 months, we've effectively shut down the predatory lending industry in Illinois. With this, this industry was draining at least $400 million a year out of the pockets of Illinoisans who were paying, on average, 300% interest rate on short-term loans. The city of Chicago just instituted their lending equity ordinance that mandates that banks help the city in order to do business with it. And we have the Cook County Equity Fund Task Force. What does it say when it's novel for a government body to state that, quote, from the report, government should take action to address structural barriers that prevent the meaningful advancement of equity? Well, it's an admission that government at all levels has been historically and tragically complicit in the racial wealth gap we're suffering from today. It's also an admission that some government recognizes the cancerous effect of that gap on every aspect of our society and that it has a critical responsibility to undo the damage. I love what's in this report. I've been involved in community and economic development initiatives throughout the country for the better part of three decades. There are a ton of well-intentioned initiatives out there, but just a handful that have actually moved the needle were driven by local input and have aimed to actually fix the problem, not just apply bandages over the wound. Guaranteed, uh, guaranteed income, property tax reform, all are critical issues. The one closest to my heart 
and that of the Woodstock Institute has to do with the bill that was just recently championed by the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus and signed into law just a little over a year ago, the Predatory Loan Prevention Act. I mentioned it earlier, but the law effectively shut down that lending industry in Illinois, except for a few bad apples we're still trying to clean up now. But it's the toughest law in the country. With a lot of the predatory lending stores shut down and boarded up, how awesome would it be for us to encourage diverse businesses to open up inside of those facilities, like a phoenix rising out of the ashes? Or to help consumers with responsible and affordable alternatives when they have short-term cash needs? The ideas in this report are not aspirational. They are achievable. Asking people what they need lays a much more realistic foundation for success than someone thinking that they know better and coming up with all of the solutions for everybody else. That's what makes this Equity Fund Task Force different. That's what we've experienced as part of the Vital Communities team. And that's why we're so grateful to President Prankwickle and her team. They're from the government. They're actually helping. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we'll, see, we'll hear from Lisa Bly Jones from the Chicago Jobs Council and Kate Redling, the Coalition for Black Lives. So, oh, first off. Well, good morning. Good morning. I am Dr. Lisa Bly Jones, and I am the CEO of the Chicago Jobs Council. And so something else that is meaningful to me today is to acknowledge that I come behind President Preckwinkle in the role at the Chicago Jobs Council. So I am honored to be here with you today. <laughs> this is a great day. Anytime we are able to invest in equitable practices for people, it's a great day to me. At the Jobs Council, we recognize that systemic Institutional and individual racism creates disparities in the way people of color fare in the labor market, which is why we advocate for policy changes that reduce racial disparities in employment and improve economic outcomes for job seekers who are marginalized by racism and other systemic barriers. At the Jobs Council, we have deepened our commitment to racial equity and are refining our anti-racist workforce development framework. The framework will be used to guide the implementation and operationalize <laughs> of the Jobs Council strategic priorities. And we will be and it will be used to provide a process for field partners to understand and advance anti-racist workforce development strategies. The vast majority of workforce development funding in Illinois comes from federal resources. These funds tend to carry federal restrictions on how they can be used that may be functionally screening out job seekers with the most barriers to employment and the organizations that serve them. Throughout 2020 and 2021, the Jobs Council started to build and convene a table to develop a comprehensive state level skills for good jobs agenda. It lifts up the importance of investing in equitable workforce development using state funds and eliminating structural barriers. The collective work of the Equity Fund Task Force allowed us to outline priorities, provide input and recommend policies and structural changes that Cook County government could pursue to address systemic racism and persistent disparities. We kept community and people at the center of our discussions. The Vital Communities Group stressed place-based investments with a community-centered approach and what's locally desired in the area of business and sector development, employment and wages, entrepreneurship, financial inclusion, housing security, social safety nets, and supports. I am thrilled to participate in a process where community-facing organizations have an active role and voice in the resource allocation process. When we imagine people reaching their full potential, 
The recommendations from this task force put us on a clear path to building a better, stronger Cook County for all. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kate Redling. I'm with the Budget for Black Lives Coalition and reporting from the safe and thriving category of President Preckwinkle's Equity Task Force. We acknowledge and appreciate President Preckwinkle, her team, including the Justice Advisory Council, my Cook County Commissioner, Brandon Johnson. But most of all, we thank the members of the community who have and continue to lift their voices, take to the streets, write letters, and testify on behalf of the most marginalized and exploited community members. It takes a great deal of courage to sustain that type of effort, especially when you're standing for equity and justice. Thank you to the people who push and fight for healthy, sustainable investments into black and brown communities and away from the typical carceral system. We, the Budget for Black Lives Coalition, is comprised of Seoul, Southsiders Organizing for Unity and Liberation, the People's Lobby, the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, Chicago Community Bond Fund, and National Nurses United. We urge this body to continue to build and fund community engagement and partnership within and throughout Cook County. We've seen that the county is uniquely positioned to take on some of the most important work of our lifetime. Community-based mental health first responder programs in suburban Cook County, reentry resource programs with an emphasis on dignified housing, and robust services that mitigate crimes of poverty that perpetuate the cycles of incarceration. These are initiatives that drive the Budget for Black Lives Coalition to stand firm for healthy, thriving communities. On behalf of the Budget for Black Lives Coalition, we welcome the continued level of engagement that President Preckwinkle and her team have demonstrated during the past almost year. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, we couldn't do this work without our partners in the foundation uh, community. We're particularly grateful to uh, MacArthur and Chicago Community Trust for their support of our um, public safety initiatives, particularly criminal justice reform initiatives, and also to Chicago Community Trust for their support of our equity initiatives. Anna Lee. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, and I want to thank uh, President Preckwinkle for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, I want to first congratulate um, um, President Preckwinkle and your team uh, for this important milestone with the release of this important report. Uh, my name is Anna Lee. I am the Senior Director of Community Impact from the Chicago Community Trust. Um, and I am not only proud of the release of this report, but really proud of the collaborative work of the Cook County Equity Task Force um, and, and helped us get us uh, to this moment um, as we think about operation, operationalizing equity in government. Um, that's a hard word to say, <laughs> operationalizing. We all have been struggling over that one. Um, you know, I want to mention that the Chicago Community Trust is the region's community foundation. We work with community organizations and also with donors um, in thinking about how we close the racial and ethnic wealth gap. Um, we are focusing all of our resources and our efforts to address the disparities um, in household wealth, particularly on black and Latinx families. Um, and it is all in hopes um, that we uh, close these disparities so that we make the Chicago region more equitable, more thriving, and connected. I come to this, um, this morning's uh, press release as a member of the, um, of the, of, of the uh, Thriving uh, Communities Task Force. And I, um, oh, I just want to mention that um, I come to here um, to the 
to the task force as a lead of the uh, Chicago Community COVID Rapid Response Fund, which raised $35 million to address the most urgent needs um, of the region uh, during the early months of COVID. So it was a natural uh, partnership um, as, as a member of the task force. I want to mention that amid the pandemic, uh, we work uh, toward a more equitable recovery. Um, we recognize the importance of multi-sector collaboration. And no one does this alone, right? We know that one sector cannot um, solve for the challenges that we are facing. Um, and we recognize that in order to do so, solutions must be community-led. Ne we need to amplify the voices of our communities. Um, and, and we do that by um, working together with government, with philanthropy, with community-based organizations, and with community leaders. All of this we do um, to work towards systemic sustained change. And I really believe that the report that is being released today will help us uh, get there. As a member of the task force, specifically the Safe and Thriving Community subgroup, um, we took rare time to establish trust and also come up with solutions um, that um, by defining what equity is for all of us, because we all come at it in different, um, different perspectives. Um, and what resulted uh, were actionable plans. Um, my colleagues here mentioned that earlier, that these are not aspirational, but we are really looking to operationalize and embed policies that are intersectional, um, solutions that are looking to increase outcomes in public health, economic development, and justice. So as a representative of philanthropy, I know the importance of coordinating with our public sector partners and as someone who works deeply in addressing the region's most urgent needs, I am grateful for the partnership with Cook County and eager to implement these recommendations to make our region more resilient. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Nick. So the uh, next steps for the task force once uh, the board approves the report and the funding recommendations is to um, do a deeper dive and term determine what those uh, timelines are. I will say that it took us decades to get here and it's going to take us some time to eliminate those structural barriers and the systemic racism that exist. Um, we can do that um, over time in an intentional way over the next few years with our partners um, and with the continued funding of the equity fund, which we've committed to um, increasing it over time through any of our surplus revenue. So time, it will take some time. We're doing intentional work. We're going to be mapping out what the metrics of success are based on what those socioeconomic outcomes that you heard earlier. Um, and we are going to pull in as many partners as we can to make sure that we can do the work. Well, the organizations will still do their work, right? We have community partners, um, and these organizations are subject matter experts and care just as much as we do about creating equitable future, right? So um, this is the intersection of the public, private, community-based um, entities that can drive real change in the same way that these policies and racist um, policies and practices were implemented. Now we're saying that we can reverse those over time with the help of the subject matter experts in their communities and doing their work, but also in doing the work that government needs to do. So it's a tie, right? But Not necessarily, right, so not necessarily. All of these organizations are doing their work in a, in a, a cross 
disciplinary fact. So we have individuals who are working to eliminate housing um, and increase housing security. We have in, um, organizations that are working on equity specifically, but these organizations are multidisciplined, um, doing the work not just around equity, but also service delivery to our residents across the county. Thank you. You know, I, I am very grateful to all of our our 89 partners, um, they're going to continue, as Lynn has said, to do their work. They have been good enough to <coughs> provide us with advice and guidance on how to make investments with our equity fund dollars, and um, we're very grateful for that. Okay, so the question is on the, for those of you who didn't hear it, on the Cannabis Business Development Fund. So the Cannabis Business Development Program will be implemented by and under the leadership of Commissioner Lowry and uh, the Cannabis Commission that was formed a few years ago. It really does um, address and will look at helping those social equity applicants um, who are interested in growing um, their cannabis business, um, starting to be entrepreneurs so that they can um, be impactful in their communities and hopefully in the long term close the racial wealth gap. Um, so the program itself is going to be developed upon um, the approval of the report and the funding um, by the Board of Commissioners at our May 12th uh, board meeting, but we will work very closely with Commissioner Lowry and the members of the Cannabis Commission to shape out what that looks like. It is a small amount of $2 million over the next couple years. That's just seed funding to get them up and established. There's going to be some administrative support that needs to happen, um, but then um, the bulk of the money will go to actual grant and through a competitive bid process for those social equity applicants um, to get resources, whether it is at the intersection of the justice system and creating restorative programs, whether it's economic development and helping them with their licenses, um, or um, giving them access to the data that they need. Those are the type of um, activities that the uh, fund will support. Sure, I'm sorry. That was Lynetta Haynes Turner, Chief of Staff. Okay, thank you. Um, and just one follow up. Can you define what a social equity applicant is? Like, are there parameters for um, like income or like what other background? All right, so the question is what is a social equity applicant? I will just say shortly that that is, will still be defined, but we are going to follow the guidelines already established at the state level. All right, you want to take the, all right, off-topic questions will be later. Go ahead. Who's next? Nick. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning. Okay, so the question is priorities within the $50 million fund. Well, I believe in going big or going home, so all of them are priorities, right? Um, we have put a significant amount of money um, behind some of the more larger systemic changes, um, like creating a community information exchange that network providers um, can share information about um, individuals who are receiving services and make sure that there's gaps. Um, there are um, funds um, for transforming places um, to advance our place-based initiative in suburban Cook County in particular, um, and then funds for equity and grant making. All of this work is critically important. Um, I think the, the, the foundation of the work moving forward to ensure that we're successful is around the three C's, collaboration, coordination, 
um, and uh, collective kind of energy and communication. So with that being said, I think these 25 policy recommendations, as I said before, we're not going to eliminate racism overnight. However, being very intentional and having a clear path forward with all of these 25 recommendations and many of our wonderful partners um, themselves from the task force will help us get there. So everything is a priority um, that is laid out and it's intentional for us to be thinking about and doing the work each and every day moving forward. Good morning. I wanted to, I, I think also for Lynetta to ask about some of these specific proposals. I know that we've talked about the transforming places in the context of ARPA, but I'm still just a little unclear on if you could just define places a little more uh, specifically. Are these municipalities? Are they neighborhoods? And can you give us an idea of how many places we're talking about and when we'll know which specific places are being targeted? Okay, so the question is what's the definition of place? and uh, which communities are targeted. Yeah, so we fully, I'll give you a little bit, Alex, um, but we really want to um, have a much broader discussion about the policy recommendations. So leading up to our May 12th board meeting, we will have a special hearing um, we'll, which will showcase not just us, but all of our task force members talking about and bringing to life these policy recommendations. For transforming places, um, Alex, you referenced, um, we put a significant amount of money through our ARPA investments for this project, and um, we were very intentional when we were doing our work to uh, build the ARPA um, investment plan, but also to make sure that we were tying and aligning um, with the equity fund and the task force because they go hand in hand. Uh, for the transforming places, it really is an expansion of the work currently happening, um, particularly in suburban Cook um, with the partnership of the United Way. Um, as the program administrator in doing what they call neighborhood networks, and some of those in same kind of model with place-based models um, within the city of Chicago, so think Invest Southwest. The whole idea is to shift the paradigm of how government does its work. To typically, government leads, we go into a community, um, we tell them what they need, we may give them a little bit of funding, and then we disappear. This changes that so that community leads, they tell us what they need, and that we then put all of our resources and coordinate them in a sustainable way over time. Um, so the communities are going to be um, determined um, using data. Um, so that is very important to us. Um, and the data is going to come from um, our COVID, um, during the COVID, we had a social vulnerability index that the Department of Public Health put together for us. So thinking about those highest risk communities um, in suburban Cook uh, and then working with them. Um, so we're thinking right now three to five um, communities specifically in the South and Southwest and then perhaps um, a, a community or two within the city of Chicago to start that pilot. That is anticipated to be, you know, two to five years to really start to see that impact. 